What's up developers and welcome back to this new video where we will be diving into a powerful authentication system which is Laravel Sanctum. Quick pause, do you want to support the channel and want me to continue on creating content? Well, you can support the channel on Patreon right now where you get benefits just as a private Discord group where you can share your coding issues and other developers will help you out. If you are interested to join, the link to the Patreon can be found in the description down below. Before we start off with this course, I do want to let you know what level I expect you to be at before you start. Obviously for your own good, because Laravel Sanctum isn't for beginners. And you do need to have a decent understanding of APIs, since they are pretty difficult to understand when you start off using them. Now you got to make sure that you have a good understanding of the Laravel framework itself. You don't need to dream about Laravel at night, but you do need to have a clear understanding of routing, controllers, models, factories, and so on. If you don't, I'll add a link to my Laravel 9 course in the description down below, which you can follow before you start off with the Laravel Sanctum course. Now what is Laravel Sanctum? I've touched on it a little bit in the introduction, but Laravel Sanctum is a package that has been created by the developers of Laravel itself. Sanctum is mostly used for developers that either want to build a single page application, mobile application, or basic token based APIs. Laravel also offers an alternative, which I have covered on this channel before, which is named Laravel Passport. The difference between both of them is the fact that Laravel Passport implements the OAuth 2.0 authentication system. If you don't need that, Laravel Sanctum is the easiest alternative. Besides that, Laravel Passport is a little bit more complex to implement, while Sanctum stands for featherweight, meaning that it should be very, e meaning that it should be very easy to implement. Now, what is an API? Understanding what an API is is very difficult when you start using it for the first time. The best possible way to learn working with ABIs is obviously by using it. Whenever you read articles on the internet about it, you'll go crazy and probably think that you're dealing with the most complex thing that have ever existed. Now in coding language, an API is a set of programming code which enables data transmission between one software to another. Pretty cool, isn't it? So the API that we're going to build, so the API that we're going to build in this application can literally be used within another application. Now keep in mind that I can't explain it all through slides. It's very difficult to cover every single topic right now regarding to APIs. Think about the different HTTP methods, RESTful, states, and so on. So I'll be covering most of them during the actual code demonstration and not the slides. Since the level of Laravel Sanctum isn't for beginners, I also expect you to understand how to set up a Laravel project, make your own database, connect with it, and run your project inside a browser. The basic topics won't be covered in this video. That being said, let's get straight into setting up a project, installing Laravel Sanctum, and setting up a database. I've just transitioned to my CLI, where I'm located inside a folder called Workspace, where I store my Laravel projects. Right here, we're going to install a new Laravel project through the Laravel Installer tool, which is pretty easy and straightforward, since we only need to run the Laravel new Laravel underscore Sanctum command. If we hit enter, a new subdirectory will be created right here with the name Laravel Sanctum. If we just wait a minute until the installation has been completed. All right. Now that we have set up a project, it's time to move on and install Laravel Sanctum through Composer. So inside the CLI, we need to change directories inside our Laravel underscore Sanctum folder. If we hit enter and perform an LS, you'll see that we have a default Laravel project. Now we're going to install Laravel Sanctum as a composer package, which needs to be done by saying composer require laravel forward slash sanctum. If we hit enter and just wait a minute before the installation has been completed, you'll see that right here, laravel sanctum has been installed as a package. Now laravel also gives you the option to publish configuration and migration files, what they do with most packages. This is optional, but I usually tend to do it just in case there are some configuration settings I'd like to change up. Now to publish Sanctum's configuration and migration file, we need to perform the php artisan vendor colon publish, which will look inside the vendor folder. And then we need to call the provider, which will be dash dash provider is equal to a set of double colon. Then inside the colon, we're going to look inside the vendor folder for the provider, which is stored inside the Laravel folder, backslash Sanctum backslash Sanctum service provider. Let's hit enter. All right. 
Artisan responded back with a message saying that the migration has been copied from the vendor directory to the database migrations folder and the configuration file inside the convict folder already exists. Which is alright, because it hasn't overridden it. We have just published our migrations, which obviously means that we should migrate them as well. But before we can do that, we do need to set up a database. Now there are different options how you can do that. This can either be done through the CLI or a database client like Table Plus or the database client inside Visual Studio Code. Now since I'm already inside the CLI, I can simply perform the MySQL command, which gives me access to MySQL. And we can basically say, well, create me a database named Laravel underscore Sanctum. Let's close it off with a semicolon and let's hit enter. So it has created a database. Now what I want you to do is to basically make sure that you have a database client to open your database. What I usually use is table plus. So let's actually search for it. I will set it up and I'll see you back once that's done. All right, as you can see, I'm connected to my Laravel Sanctum database and I've also opened Visual Studio Code where I have opened my project. Now inside the root of our directory, we have a .env file. So let's open it because we need to change up the database credentials. Now the host connection port and database name are all right. The username for me is root and the password of mine is dari1234. These credentials are up to you since it should be the database you just created, which are MySQL username and password. If we save it and navigate back to iTerm, perform the exit in MySQL, then inside our Laravel Sanctum folder, we need to perform the PHP artisan migrate command. And as you could see, the four default migrations of Laravel have been migrated. Whenever you're going to work with APIs, you'll be sending back quite some responses to the user. And since we're going to send back either a success message or an error message, it's best practice to define a trait with both responses, which we can reuse every single time we need to send back a response. A trait is something you have used quite a lot if you have used Laravel before, and even if you're not aware of it. A trait allows you to reuse pieces of code in Laravel, which is an incredible method of saving yourself time from writing the same pieces of code over and over. There isn't a command inside Laravel where you could simply create a new trait, since this needs to be done manually. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code, and let's open the app folder, and let's define a new folder right here, called Traits, with a capital T. Then inside the Traits folder, we're going to create a new file, named HTTP Responses. Now there are a couple things that we need to define right here before we can put it in use. Since we're working with a PHP file, we're obviously going to start with a PHP opening tag, followed with a namespace, which makes it a lot easier to refer to this specific trait in other files. The namespace is pretty much the path to this file, which is app backslash traits. Then we could define our trait by adding the trait keyword, followed with the name of our trait. Now the best practice is to keep it equal to the file name. So let's say HTTP responses. Right here, we're going to define a new function which will return back a message with a status code of 200, which basically means that the message was successful. So let's say protected function success. The success method accepts three parameters. The first one will be the data that we're going to send back to the user. Then we have a message, which has a default value of null. And finally, we have a code, which is equal to 200, which is pretty much the status code. Now the range of 200 plus are statuses that will tell the client a request was successful. We're going to pass in a default of 200, but keep in mind that there are examples where you might need to add a different status code, but we can easily done that by overriding the default status code that we have. Then inside the success method, we're going to define a return statement of the response method, and we're going to return a JSON. So let's chain the JSON method to it. Now the JSON method accepts an array, which will convert the actual array to a JSON object. So let's go inside our JSON method and let's add brackets and hit enter. We're going to pass in three key value pairs. The first one will be the status, which will be a string of, let's say, request was successful. Then we have our message, which is optional and will come from our message that we have right here. So it's not a string, excuse me, but a message. Finally, we got our data, 
which also comes from the parameter right here called data. Now, outside of our array, we're going to add a default, which will be a comma variable code. So we're basically going to send back the default code of 200 by default and which can be overridden. Now, what we actually could do is copy our entire success method and paste it down below. Since we're going to define an error message as well, or a method, which pretty much does the same thing, except sending back an error message rather than a success message. Now, the biggest difference is obviously the name. It's not success, but it's error. And I made a typo right here because success is double S. Now we will send back a data. We will also send back a message, but we're not gonna send a default code of 200, but we're not actually gonna send a default code. Instead of sending back a request was successful, we're going to send a message of error has occurred. We will send back the optional message and the data. Now this trait will be used within our controller. So let's navigate to the CLI where we need to define our first controller by saying PHP artisan make me a controller named odd controller. Let's hit enter. Our controller has been created successfully. So let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code, open the HTTP folder, controllers folder, and the auth controller file. Whenever you want to make use of a trait inside another file, we need to go inside the class, but still at the top, remove the comment, write down use, followed with the name of a trait. In our case, it will be HTTP responses. Don't forget to hit enter so we can pull in the class. And this is the last time I'm gonna say it because we are going to pull in quite some classes. Now, before we move on on adding our routes and using our trait, I think it's good to set up Postman real quick because it allows us to test our API routes directly. Now, Postman is an API client that makes it easy for us developers to create, share, and test APIs. I can't cover every single aspect of Postman. Postman is pretty big, but for now, we're going to navigate to Google Chrome and we're going to search for postman.com forward slash downloads. Now make sure that you download the Postman app for your device. Open it and I'll see you back once it has been installed. If for some reason you can't download Postman on your device, you could also replace it with a Chrome extension. So let's open a new tab and let's search for advanced REST client. Now it's the first link because it's from Chrome itself. If you install it, you'll get a new extension inside your Chrome browser where the main functionalities will pretty much be the same as what we're going to do in Postman. Once you have installed Postman and open it, you will most likely will land on the same screen that I have. It might ask you to log in, but if you're not completely sure about it, don't worry because it will do once you will get started with it. We're going to start off by creating our first workspace. Using workspaces give you a great separation of projects with the ability to work with other developers as well. In the top left menu, you'll see a drop down menu called Workspace. So let's click on it. And then you'll see a button right here to the right named Create Workspace. We have been redirected to a new form where we can define the workspace that we're going to use. Now let's add a title of Laravel Sanctum Tutorial. The description or the summary is yt code with Dari. And the visibility should be set to personal so we can only access it ourselves. If you have done that, click on create workspace and voila, we have been redirected to our actual workspace. So let's go over the interface real quick and talk about the different elements on our screen. Now, the first thing that you might notice is the fact that Postman's interface has been divided into two sections. We have a left side panel right here, which will be the area where we will be creating our collections and endpoints of our API. Then we got the big right side panel which is a lot bigger, obviously, because this is the main area where we will be doing our main work. Think about creating our request, defining the body, and so on. Now within our workspace, so pretty much right here, you'll see a button called Create Collection. Each collection will produce its own documentation. I try to create multiple collections for the actions that we're going to perform. So let's actually create one right now, and let's rename it, which is pretty important, otherwise all the names will be New Collection. And let's name this authentication, where we basically will store all HTTP requests dedicated to authentication. Now let's click on the plus icon right here as well, because we also are gonna create tasks, which has the HTTP request of all tasks that we have. 
Now, if we right click on the authentication collection, you'll see an option where we can add a request, which is the same as a URL request that you add inside a browser. So let's add one and you can name your request as well. So let's say that we want a request for a login. Then you have the HTTP method that you could change right here and you can enter a request URL. But for now, we're gonna call it login and don't forget to click on save. If you don't and you close off your request, it will remove all data that you have added inside of your input fields, URL, and so on. Now let's create another one. Let's say that we have the register request. So name it register. Remember, whenever you want to perform a register request, you're going to persist or post data to the database. So we need to make sure that we replace the HTTP method to post. As you can see in the right, it still says get, and that's happening because we haven't saved it. So if we save the request, you'll see that the icon right here has been changed to post. I'm not gonna cover all aspects and topics of Postman because that can be an entire course itself. But for now, I want to move on to routing so we could actually test out these routes inside Postman through our API. Now routes will be stored inside Visual Studio Code of course, inside the routes folder, and then inside the api.php file, rather than a web.php file when working with web routing. So let's open it. And let's continue on with the previous example where we were working with the login route. Let's start off by deleting the comments because it's annoying me. And we're not gonna focus on the route that we have right here yet, which will come later on. Now we're gonna define a new route right here. And we're not gonna do anything special or different compared to building routes inside the web.php file. We're gonna say route, colon, colon. Now remember, we have a login endpoint, but we don't have a front end. So we're gonna skip the get page where we're gonna show a login page to the user and we're directly gonna call the post method. Now inside our post method, we have our endpoint, which will be forward slash login. Then we have a second parameter, which will be an array of the auth controller, colon, colon, class. And our array has a second value as well, which will be the method that we're going to call, which will be login. Now let's save it. And we haven't defined our login method inside the auth controller, so let's do that real quick. Let's open the auth controller. Right under our trait, we're going to define a public function login. And we're going to return a simple string. So return a string of this is my login method which should be printed out if we make a request to Postman to our endpoint. So let's test it out. Let's save it, navigate back to Postman. Let's go to our login endpoint. Now, this is the point where you need to either run PHP, Artisan Surf, or add a URL whenever you have run valet link. Now I'm using valet, so I can basically say Larvel underscore sanctum dot test forward slash login. It should be the entire route so you can't just simply add, let's say, forward slash login and expect Postman to understand what the URL is. Now, don't forget that we need to change our HTTP methods from get to post. Now, let's click on send. We have just performed our forward slash login endpoint with a post method. You'll see that we have been prompted with a 404 status code, meaning that the request resource could not be found. Now this is happening because all routes inside the api.php file will consist of a prefix right in front of your endpoint. And this is a best practice that you should apply whenever working with APIs. Always use the forward slash API prefix inside your URL. Now if you decide that you don't need it or you want to change your forward slash API endpoint to let's say forward slash version one v1, which is common as well, you need to navigate to the app folder, provide this folder, where you have a route service provider file. If we scroll down to the boot method, you'll see that all routes from the routes forward slash api.php file have a prefix of API. So if we navigate back to Postman, go right in front of forward slash login and add API forward slash, click on send. You'll see that our message of this is my login method has been printed out with a status code of 200, which is okay. Now, obviously, users have the chance to register themselves as well. So let's navigate back to our api.php file and let's define a new route right under our forward slash login route. Let's say route, colon, colon, post, because it's a post request to forward slash register. 
from the art controller colon colon class and the method that we will define in a second is the register method if we navigate back to our art controller and define a new function right under our login function called register and we're not going to return a string right here but we will return a response which is a method we're going to chain the json method to it and we're going to add our string inside the json method let's say this is my register method now the reason why we are improving our return value right here to a json response is because using json responses in api is almost mandatory if we save it and save the api.php file as well navigate to postman save our request right here open the register request add the url of laravel underscore sanctum dot test forward slash api forward slash register and let me actually zoom in a little bit keep it as a post request click on send and right here you'll see that the response value is different right now because the color is red and it's quoted and this is happening because we're sending back a json response now there's one more route that I want to add related to authentication and that's giving users the option to log out which eventually will delete the API token of Sanctum. So let's navigate to Visual Studio Code. Let's define a new route, colon colon. It's a post request because we're going to do something within our database. It's to forward slash logout. We're gonna call the auth controller method, colon colon class and the method name is logout. We're not done yet. Let's save it and navigate to our auth controller, define a new public function logout, and let's return another response, JSON, and the value is this is my logout method. Let's test this one out as well. In Postman, create a new request. Let's name it logout. The method is post. The URL is laravel underscore sanctum. We can actually open the login and, and replace login with logout. Don't forget to save it. Click on send. And this is my logout method has been printed out. Now the point of this tutorial is that we create the forward slash login, forward slash the register and forward slash logout endpoints. But then a user will be redirected to the forward slash tasks endpoint, where tasks of a specific user are visible. So let's navigate back to the CLI because we need to make sure that we create a new controller, migration, and model for our tasks. I prefer to create my controller separate from my migration and model because I use plural names for my controller. And whenever I add a dash C flag when I'm making my model, it will make a singular controller name. Let's first run PHP artisan make me a controller named tasks controller. And we're going to add the dash air flag to it to make it a resource class. So we don't need to define every single route for our CRUD functionalities. If we hit enter, you'll see that our controller has been created successfully. Now let's perform the PHP artisan make me a model command to obviously make a model called task. And we're going to add the dash M flag to it, which will define our migration as well. Let's hit enter. All right. Now our model and migration both have been created. We're not going to work on the model and migration yet, but we will define the route for our tasks. So let's navigate back to our API.php file. And since we have created a resource class, we can define a new route. Colin Colin, but instead of saying get post, patch, put, whatever, we could call the resource method. Now within the resource method, we again need to pass in two parameters. The first one is the endpoint, which will be forward slash tasks. The second one won't be an array, but simply the controller. So tasks controller. Don't forget to pull it in, colon, colon, class. Now we're not gonna test out all routes inside Postman, but what we can do just to double check it is navigate to iTerm, perform the PHP artisan or route colon list command. And as you could see, it has created API for slash tasks to the index store, create, show, update, destroy, and edit methods. For now, we're going to leave the task as it is, but once we finish the login and register endpoints, we'll get back to it because only authenticated users of Laravel Sanctum are allowed to read, create, delete, and edit tasks. It's time to focus on the real work where Laravel Sanctum comes into play. Once we register and log in a new user, 
An API token needs to be generated that can be used to make authenticated API requests inside our application. Now be aware that whenever you want to generate API tokens, let's actually navigate to the user model inside the models folder right here. You have to add the has API tokens trait inside your user model. By default, it's added, but I'm just mentioning it just in case you run into errors and for some reason your has API token trait has not been added. Now we're going to start up with our register method, since that's the spot where you start if you don't have a user inside your application. The process inside the register method will be pretty similar to the work we've already done building CRUD functionalities. We first got to make sure that we validate incoming data, then we have to create a new user, and once a user has been created, we need to send back a response with a newly generated API token. Now let's start off by validating the incoming data inside the register method. So let's open the auth controller right here. We're gonna work inside the register method, but before we do that, we're going to navigate back to item where we're gonna create a PHP artisan make request. So a form request called store user request. If we navigate back to Visual Studio Code, our request will be stored inside the request folder where we have the store user request method. Now inside the rules method, we're gonna simply return key value pairs of our validation. The keys will be the columns inside our database or user's table we need to fill in based on the migrations, while the values will be certain rules that the input fields need to comply with. I think I've mentioned input fields twice right now, so let me show you what I mean with input fields inside Postman. Because we obviously don't have a form where a user needs to enter through input fields, but in Postman, you have a section right here called body, where we have form data and xww-form-url encoded. Right here, you have key value pairs, where the key will basically be the column name, and the value will be the actual value that you want to submit. So let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code, and right here, we're gonna start off with the name. So the name of a user is required, it's a string, and it's a maximum of 255 characters. Then we have the email, which is also required. It's a string, it's maximum 255, and it should be unique on the table users. Finally, we have the password, which should be required. It needs to be confirmed by a password confirmation, and we're gonna call the rules forward slash password, colon colon defaults method. So let's close it off and let's navigate to our register method. Since we created our request, we should pull it in as a parameter because we're gonna make use of the request object. So let's say store user request, dollar sign request. Right above our return statement, we're simply gonna call our request object, chain the validated method to it. And what we actually want to validate is the request object, all. Now, once a user of our application passes the validation rules, we should be able to register them as a new user, which we will be doing through Eloquent. So right under our request, let's say that we're gonna make a new user called dollar sign user, which is equal to the user class, colon colon create. Now inside the create method, we're gonna pass in an array since we need to pass in key value pairs to our user model. The keys will represent the column names and the values will be coming from the same request object that we have right here. So let's say that we have our name, which is the request name. We have our email, which is coming from the request email. Then we have our password, which is hash, pull it in, colon, colon, make. And what we want to hash is obviously the request password. Once a newly user has been validated and created, we got to make sure that we return a message to the user and we're gonna return this successfully, which is the success message or method that we created inside our HTTP response trait. So let's remove our entire return statement. And what we're basically gonna say right here is we're gonna return this success, which knows based on the trait that this success is coming from the trait. Then we're gonna pass in an array right here with two key value pairs. We obviously want to send back the entire user that we just created, which should be the value of variable user. And then we're gonna create a new token. 
which will be generated from the user object where we're going to chain the create token method to it, which will return a new Laravel Sanctum access token instance, which is an API token that is hashed using the SHA-256 hashing before it's being stored inside the database. Now you need to name it. So let's say API token of, and let's concatenate the user name. We're not done yet because we need to chain the plain text token property of the new access token instance, which is needed to display the value of the user rather than the hashed value. And we actually can delete the parentheses, excuse me, because we're dealing with a property and not a method. Let's put it into use. Let's save it. Let's navigate back to Postman and let's open our register URL. It's a post method, the URL is okay. We're not completely done yet. We can't just click on send and expect it to work. As you can see, we're getting a 403 meaning forbidden because we also need to add two headers right inside of the header tab. Now, whenever we're going to implement the JSON API specifications, you have to check whether the header has been set. There are two required headers that you have to add, which will already be set once you return a JSON object. So the first one is called accept and the value will be application. And I'm going to spill it out. It's the vnd.api plus JSON. So let's just click on it in the dropdown. The second one is called content dash type, which has a value of pretty much the same. So let's copy it and let's paste it as a content type value. Now what these two keys do, so the accept and the content type, is basically telling the client what is being sent lives up to the protocol in a given JSON API specifications. We're ready to perform our post request, but first we need to navigate to the body tab, click on form data, because we obviously need to pass in a name, email, and password. So let's do that. Let's create a new key called name, which is equal to code with Dari. We have a key of email, which is info at darinazar.com. We have the last one, which is password, which is equal to test one, two, three, four explanation mark. Now, if we click on send right now, you'll see that we're getting a message saying that the action is unauthorized. Now, the reason why this is happening is because we're using a custom form request. So if we open our storm user request, you'll see that the authorization has been set to false, which needs to be set to true to determine if a user is authorized to make this request. And apparently I have a typo here as well. So let's replace it with a forward slash. All right. Let's navigate back to Postman. Let's click on send. We've been prompted with a 422, which means that we have impossible content. Inside the body of our response, you can see a message which is telling us what goes wrong. At the moment, we have an error saying that the password confirmation does not match. I purposely forgot to add the password confirmation inside the params because I don't want to show you the happy path all the time. So let's add a new parameter. Let's say that we have our password underscore confirmation. Now the value needs to be equal to the value of our password. So test one, two, three, four, forward slash. If we click on send right now, you will see that the status code we're getting back from the browser is 200, meaning that the user has been created. If we look inside the body, you'll see a message that the request was successful. We have our data section with the actual user and a token. Now, before we continue on with logging a user in, let's navigate back to table plus and let's refresh our users table. Now this speaks for itself. There's nothing special right here since we have an ID, name, email, email verified, password, and so on. But API tokens will be stored inside a personal access token table. So let's open it. Right here, you will see that one personal access token has been stored with ID number two. It's referring to the user model. It has a tokenable ID, which is basically the ID of the user inside the user's table, the name of the token, so API token of code with Ari. It has the hash token and some other fields. Now let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and let's open the auth controller because we also need to fix in the login method right here. We need to make sure that we perform a couple steps. We've got to obviously make sure that we validate the email and password of a user to make sure that they can log in. Now, based on that result, we got to either send back an error message or a user should be able to log in. If they can log in, a new token needs to be generated, which they can use to access restricted routes. We got to start off by validating the incoming email and password. 
Just like the register method, we're gonna make a form request through the terminal by saying php artisan make me a request called login user request. Now let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code. Let's open the login user request inside the request method. Let's replace the return value of the authorized method to true again. And inside the rules method, we're gonna basically check two things, the email and password. So the key is email. Well, the value will be the array of it's required. It should be a string and it needs to come from the email column. Then we have our password, which needs to be required. And I've got a typo right here. It needs to be a string and it needs to have a minimum of six characters. Now let's save it. Let's navigate back to our auth controller and let's replace the return statement that we have. Now let's first actually add our request as a parameter inside the login method. So login user request, object request. Then we can validate it by saying, well, get me the request, validate it. And what we want to validate is the request all. Now we can actually already test this out inside Postman with wrong credentials since it will send back an error message. So let's navigate back to Postman and let's save our API register endpoint. Let's open the login endpoint and let's perform the same steps. We don't have params. We don't have authorization yet. We have a header of accept, which is the application. Then we have the content type, which is coming from, well, pretty much the same value. Then we have our body. Let's save it actually, so we don't lose our headers anymore. Form data. Let's say that we have an email it is test at gmail.com. Now let's submit it with only the email. If we do it right now, you'll see that we get a 422 on Prosabel's content and the error message is saying that a password field is required. Now, if we do add a password, so let's say that the password is equal to test1234, even though the user doesn't exist, we click on send, you'll see that we're getting a 200 which means that the response was all right, but it shouldn't because the user doesn't exist inside our database. Now you see that we have a small issue right here since it returned a 200 status code, which should mean that we are logged in right now. So what we have to do right here is somehow perform a check to see whether the credentials that we have right here match inside our database. Now this needs to happen right under our validation right here. What we're gonna do is first create an if statement where we will check whether an authentication attempt has not been made. So explanation mark, odd, let's pull it in, colon, colon, attempt. Now the attempt method accepts an array of key value pairs. So let's add it right here. We're not gonna pass in key value pairs directly, but we will be using the request object and we're gonna chain the only method to it because we only want to check validation on the email and on the password. If it returns true, we need to return this error. So the error of a trade, the data will be empty because there is no data. Then we have a message saying credentials do not match. And we need to add a status code of 401, meaning that the user is unauthorized. If we save it and navigate to Postman, click on send, you'll see that we received the 401 unauthorized saying that the credentials do not match. We're almost done. The next step is getting the user that is trying to log in, send it back to the user, just like we did with the register method with an API token. So first let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code. Right under our if statement, we're gonna define a new user, which is coming from the user model, colon, colon, where. We only have the email and password inside our input fields. So the where clause will be the email, which needs to match the request object email then it needs to get the first value once we got the user we could send back a return statement of this success we're going to pass in an array where the user will be our user variable that we just got from above then we're going to add the token as well which will be the user create token it will be named api token of and let's concatenate the user name. And then we're going to chain the plain text 
token property to it. And let's remove the extra white spaces that we have. Now let's navigate back to Postman and let's replace the wrong email with the email that we have inside our database. Let's click on send. And as you can see, the request was successful. We found the user from the database and a token has been created. Now that we have logged in as a user and we generated a token, it's time to do something with our API token. But before I can showcase you how that actually works, we got to start off by protecting some of our routes for unauthorized users. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and open the api.php file. Right here, you'll see that everyone that performs a request on our API has the ability to access any route, even the most important one, the forward slash tasks endpoint. So let's divide our routes into two types of routes. First, we will define the public routes, which should be available for all users, but we also got protected routes, which only authenticated users can access. Now, whenever a user wants to perform a login or register request, they're obviously dealing with the public routes because there's no point of being authenticated before accessing both routes. The goal of those routes is to authenticate a user. So let's place both routes right under our public routes. But the other two routes that we have should be protected. A user needs to be authenticated before they can log out. So let's place it right under our protected route. And the user also needs to be authenticated to create, read, delete, and update tasks. So we need to place this one right under our protected routes. Now the first route has pretty much spoiled what we're going to do right now for our protected routes, since we're going to use a middleware of the odd column sanctum to protect authenticated routes. Our route will be a little bit different since we're going to define a grouped route. So let's go right under our logout route and let's define a route, column, column, group. First, we're gonna pass in an array because we need the key value pair of the middleware that we're gonna use. The key will be middleware, while the value will be an array, single quotes, odd, colon, sanctum. Then we need to pass in a second param, so outside of our array, which is a callback function. We're basically gonna add those two routes that we just created inside our callback function. And that's it. Let's test it out. So let's open our task controller. And right inside of the index method, we're gonna return a response, a JSON with test. If we save it and navigate to Postman, and let's save our login request. Now let's create a new task inside our task collection. Let's name it get all tasks. It's gonna be a get request to laravel underscore sanctum dot test forward slash API forward slash tasks. The authorization is empty. The header will be accept. The value will be application. Content type as well with the same value. All right. If we submit our request right now, you'll see that we have been hit with a 401 which means that we are unauthorized to perform this request. Now this is happening because we are using Laravel Sanctum, it's middleware inside our API file right here. This is basically telling us that the forward slash tasks endpoints are only accessible when a user is logged in. Now it doesn't work in a way where we could go to the forward slash login endpoint, click send, have a new generated token, go to all tasks, send it again, and expect all data to be printed out right here because we're still unauthenticated. Now an authenticated request needs to be made with a valid bearer token. And we obviously created it through the forward slash login endpoint right here. This is our token. Now let's copy the token that we have right here. And whenever we want to use the token inside, let's say to get all tasks, we need to open the authorization tab. If we click on the drop down menu of type, you'll see all these different authorization types that we can use. Now the one Laravel Sanctum uses is the bearer token. So let's click on it. You'll see that to the right, a pop-up appears where we need to add our token inside our input field right here. Now this gives us an option to add a token inside the input field. So let's paste what we just copied. If we then save it and submit it, 
you will indeed see that test has been printed out inside the body of our request. Right now, we are authenticated as a user with email info at darinazar.com and we're granted to the protected routes of our application. Passing in a bearer token inside the authorization tab like we're doing right now isn't the best possible way, since a bearer token needs to be protected at all costs. The best way to handle this is defining a variable from our token value. Now, if we select our value, you'll see an option where we can set it as a variable. If we click on it, we can either find a variable or click on the plus icon to create one. Let's name it sanctum underscore token. The value obviously should be our token and the scope should be global. Now, if we click on set variable, you'll see that our variable has been printed out rather than the token value that we have. If we click on send right now, you will see that we are still authenticated to perform this request. We eventually want to send back more than test, but our tasks table is completely empty and we don't have any data to play with. So what I want to do right now is setting up our migration model and a factory so we could add dummy data inside our database. Now we're gonna start off with our migration. So let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code, open the database folder, migrations, and it's the last one that has been created. Let's start off by defining the default columns for a task first. So let's say that we have a new table, which has a data type of string with the name of name. Then we have another one, which is also a string with the name of description. Finally, we have a table string with the name of priority. And let's add a default value to it, which is medium. We're not done yet because we will need some kind of relationship with a user's table, since one task belongs to one user. But one user can have multiple tasks, so we need to define a one-to-many relationship. Therefore, we need to define a foreign key constraint where we add the column of user ID inside our task table, which will refer to the ID on the user's table. So let's go right below our primary key of ID. Let's define a new table where the data type is an unsigned big integer with the name of user ID. Now let's define the foreign key constraint right above our timestamps. So let's say table, we have a foreign key right here, which is the user ID. And let me actually align this on the line below. It references on a specific table and we're gonna do something on delete. Now the user ID is coming from the table users which will refer to the column ID. And whenever we delete one single user, all related tasks need to be deleted, which needs to be done in a cascade fashion. Now let's save it. Let's navigate back to iTerm, where we need to migrate our tables by saying PHP artisan migrate, hit enter. As you can see, our create task table has been migrated. And there are two things that we need to add inside our task model. So let's navigate to it. Let's open it right here. When we're gonna work inside the controller in a bit, we're going to pass in an array of values into our task eloquent class to insert data inside the database. In order to protect your model from possible malicious user input, we need to define our model's fillable fields. So let's say protected, fillable is equal to an array. Let's go inside the array and hit enter where we need to add values which are allowed for mass assignment. So let's say the user ID, we have the name, we have the description, and we have the priority. The second thing that we have to define right here is a relationship with the user's model. So let's go right below our fillable property. Let's define a new method by saying public function user. Since one task belongs to one user, I'm naming it singular rather than plural. We're gonna add a return statement right here of this belongs to. It belongs to a specific user, so let's call the user class right here. All right. Now, before we dive into the logic that we have to perform inside our controller, we're going to define our factory for a second so we could add dummy data inside our database. So let's navigate back to the CLI and let's perform the PHP artisan make me a factory called task factory. If we hit enter, you'll see that our factory has been created successfully. Navigate back to Visual Studio Code. 
where our factory will be stored inside the database factories folder, where we have our task factory. And inside the definition method, we could define an array of key value pairs, where the keys are the table names and the values are coming from the faker class. So let's start off from the beginning. We have our user ID, which actually isn't coming from the faker class, but from the user model, colon, colon, all. So we're gonna get all users, then we're gonna select a random user and just grab the ID. Then we have the name, which is coming from the faker class by saying this faker, the name should be unique. It's not required, but I'll just like to add it. And it should be a sentence. Then we have a description, which is this faker and just a simple string of text. Finally, we have the priority, which is coming from this faker. But instead of adding text or sentence, we're gonna add a random element. And we're gonna define the random element ourselves as an array of low, medium, and lastly, we have high. We're ready to create dummy data inside our database. We're gonna do it through Tinker. So let's navigate to iTerm and let's perform the PHP artisan Tinker command. Before we create dummy data for our tasks, we do need to add some users since we currently got one, which means that we will define tasks where the user ID is one all the time. So let's say user, colon, colon, factory, we're gonna chain the times method because we want to create, let's say 25 users. And finally, we're gonna chain the create method because they need to be created. If we hit enter, you'll see that 25 users have been added. And if we hit the arrow up and let's replace our user model with the task model. And instead of saying that we want to create 25 tasks, let's say that we want to create 250 tasks. If we hit enter, you see that the last value has an ID of 250, meaning that 250 rows have been added inside our database. And most user IDs are not the same because obviously a user can have many tasks. Now that we have defined our migration, performed all steps inside our model, and we created dummy data inside our database, it's time to move on and create the logic inside our resource controller. Let's navigate to Visual Studio Code. And let's open, well, let's actually close off all tabs that we have open because we don't need most of them. All right, now let's open a task controller. Now we're going to work from top to bottom, starting off with our index method. The easiest option right here is basically to remove our response and send back our task model, colon, colon, all. If we save it, navigate to Postman and click on send, you'll see that we received all tasks right here. Now the issue that we have is the fact that eloquent models return a collection. And like I've mentioned before, when you're working with APIs, you want to send back a JSON response. And luckily, Larva offers resources which will convert collections into nicely formatted JSON objects. So let's navigate to the CLI and let's exit Tinker and let's perform the PHP artisan and make a resource called tasks resource. Now what this command does is creating a new folder inside our HTTP folder called resources with a task resource class. When building JSON API responses, you should carefully look at the conventions that must be followed when returning a response with data. I'll try to cover most of them, but I do recommend you to look at the documentation about it, not specifically Laravel related, but general API coding principles. At the top of every JSON document, you need to start off with a data member. And the data member is pretty much the most important member that contains the primary data of the document. You don't need to define it yourself since it will be added by the resource. The actual magic happens inside a two array method. Let's remove our return statement and let's define a new one. We're gonna define an array first and close it off with a semicolon and hit enter right inside of our array. Then in here, we should define key value pairs that will represent the value of a single task. Now we obviously gonna start off with the ID of one single task. We will type hint the data type to a string, which will be this ID. The reason why I'm converting it into a string, so type hinting it, is because a server converts numeric IDs into strings. And you do need string IDs when it comes to URLs. Now let's quickly test this out inside the index method. So you see a clearer view of what the data member represents. 
If we navigate back to the task controller and actually remove our task colon colon all, we're going to return our tasks resource. We're going to add the collection method right here. Since we're going to pass in a collection to the task resource, which will then need to be converted to a JSON object. Inside our collection, we're going to hit enter. So we're basically going to get all tasks that belongs to one specific user. So let's call the task model, call and call it where. We're going to check based on the user ID. So let's say the user ID inside the tasks table needs to be equal to the authenticated user, call and call it user and chain the ID method to grab the ID of one specific user, and finally get them all. If we save it, navigate back to Postman, click on Submit. Now at the top level of our response, you'll see that a data member has been represented, which should be the top level once you return a response with data back to the user. Then inside our data member, you'll find values from a specific task that have been returned in a JSON format, which can be detected by the curly braces right here. Now these are all the tasks that are related to the authenticated user. Now let's navigate back to our tasks resource because we obviously want to send back more than the ID. We won't be adding a name description and priority as a key value pair like we did with the ID, but we're going to define a key named attributes. So let's do that. The value will be equal to an array. Now whatever we place inside the attributes array, will contain the attributes of a resource. So this should be simple for us, since it's basically the same as we did above with the ID. We got the name, which is equal to this name. We've got the description, which is equal to this description. We have the priority, which is equal to this priority. Don't forget to add the timestamps, because most of the times these are actually overlooked. So let's add it. So this created underscore at updated at is equal to this updated underscore at. Let's navigate back to Postman and let's test it out one more time. If you click on send, we're adding more and more structure to our response where we separated the actual content inside an array named attributes. The same structure needs to be implemented when working with relationships. You don't want to paste your relationships right inside of the attributes because it doesn't really have anything to do in particular with the task. So let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and right outside of our attributes, let's define a new member called relationships, which is also equal to an array. Now the values, now the data that we want to show of a user is the ID. So this user ID and don't forget to type in it to a string. Then we have the user name, which is equal to this user name. And let's also send back the user email, which is this user email. If we save it and navigate back to Postman one more time, click on send and right here, you will see that we have a pretty clear structure with our JSON response. We've got the ID of a task, You've got the attributes, which is pretty much the data of a task. And finally, we have the relationships related to a single task. Now let's move on to the next method. If we navigate to Visual Studio Code, save our task resource and close it off because we won't be needing it anymore, you'll see that we have the create method right here. Now the resource controller doesn't make use of the create method since with a web-based app, the create method is basically the page which shows a form where a user can enter data. When it comes to APIs, we don't have that, just like the login and register pages. So what we're gonna do is basically making a direct call to the store method right here. So let's just delete it. The steps that we're going to perform inside the store method are pretty similar as registering users. We first got to make sure that we validate incoming data. If the validation has passed, we're going to create a task. Then we're going to output the newly created post to the user. So let's start off with validation. Once again, I prefer to work with form request to encapsulate the validation and authorization logic. Navigate back to iTerm, perform the PHP artisan make request command called store task request. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code. Let's open our store task request where we need to start off by setting the authorization equal to true and add our validation inside the return statement of the rules method. Now it's pretty straightforward. We have a name, 
which is equal to required and it has a maximum amount of characters of 255 we have the description which is also required and only required and finally we have the priority which is equal to a required now if we save it and navigate back to our task controller we first need to make sure that we replace the request object with the form request that we created which is store task request then we got to start off by validating incoming data through the request object so let's say request validated and the data that we want to validate is coming from the request all now once the validation has passed we got to make sure that we define a new task so let's say dollar sign task is equal to task model colon colon create pass in an array and hit enter and this is pretty straightforward we're just going to add some key value pairs that we need whenever we want to create a new task so the first one will be the user id which will be a little bit different because it's not coming from the request but from the odd colon colon user and we're just going to grab the id then we have the name which is coming from the request name we have the description coming from the request description and we have the priority which is coming from the request priority now once a task has been created we got to return a new tasks resource which is the format we defined before and we're going to pass in a variable of task that we just created inside the task resource so the created task will be shown to the user once the data has been submitted now let's test it out let's save it navigate back to postman we're going to define a new request with the name of create new task it's going to be a post request laravel underscore test api tasks we don't have params we do have authorization which is coming from the bearer token and right here you see that it grabs the sanctum token by default we do need to add two headers which will be accept and the content type which is the application this one nice then we need to pass in three key value pairs inside our body tab and let's choose form data the key will be name which is new task we have the description of task description just some casual stuff then we have the priority which is low if we click on submit right now you'll see that we passed all validation checks and a new task has been created and outputted through the task resource now if we uncheck let's say priority click on send you'll see that the priority field is required and we can even get two error messages and right here you'll see that the description is required and the priority is required all right we can output all related tasks to a user we know how to create a task so let's see what the next method is inside visual studio code you'll see that we have the show method and as you can see it's accepting a route parameter of id this can be done a lot easier if we use the current method we need to make an elegant call right here of task is equal to task column where the id is equal to id and get and then we need to return something but what we can do is using some larva magic that happens behind the scenes larva allows you to replace the parameter or of id with the entire resource so task object task behind the scenes larva knows that all right there's an id coming in let me search through the task based on the id and now that we have an entire resource we can simply return a new tasks resource and pass in our task now let's test it out if we save it and let's actually go back to the terminal for a second and run php artisan route list where you'll see that the where is it the show method has an endpoint of api tasks and a route parameter so a specific id needs to be passed in right here navigate to postman let's create a new task let's name it find one task it's a get method the uri will be laravel and let me get this one 
Now let's say that we want to find a task with ID 56, I think. That was the one that we had. Well, I can actually open it. Get all tasks of a user. All right, it's 55. All right, let's do the same steps right here. Authorization, pair a token, two headers. I'll just do it real quick. Oops, I did them in the wrong order. Shouldn't really matter, but I'll just get annoyed by it. The values. We don't need a body because we're simply going to get a specific post. Click on send and right here. That went wrong. I actually meant 56. Now you can see that we got ID number 56, which is fine. But if we play around with the right parameter, so let's say one, click on send. You'll see that we're getting different tasks every single time. But in reality, you only want to get tasks that belong to the authorized user. And this can actually be solved pretty fast. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code. And right above our return statement, we're going to define an if statement. Where the condition will be, well, checking if the authorized user ID is not equal to the task user ID. If it isn't, return an error message where we don't have data. The message is you are not authorized and the status code is 403. We do need to make sure that we pull in the trade at the top. Let's say use HTTP responses. Otherwise it will throw an error. Navigate back to Postman, click on send and right here. We're not authorized to get ID number one because the user ID of that specific task is not equal to the authorized user. And we're getting an error message saying you are not authorized to make this request. If we change it back to, let's say 55, you'll see that we are able to get ID number 55, which is the first task in the list when we're getting all tasks of one specific user. All right, let's move on to the next method inside our show method which is the edit method. Now the edit method is just like the create method, which should show a form on the front end, which we don't need. So let's delete it and let's focus on the update method. If we navigate to the terminal for a second, if we look at the update method right here, you'll see that the HTTP method can either be put or patch. Whenever you decide to perform a put method, you're basically telling the client that submits data that every single field needs to be updated while the patch method only updates fields that the user has entered and leaves the untouched fields as it is. In our case, we will be performing a patch request since a user can only change the title, description, or priority of a task rather than updating all of them at the same time. So let's navigate back. Now we're gonna replace the route parameter back to the entire task. And then inside our update method, we're gonna grab our task object and chain the update method, where we're gonna pass in the request all. Once we've done that, we're simply gonna return a new tasks resource with that specific task. Let's test it out. Let's save it, navigate back to Postman, create a new task, update task as a name. Let's set the HTTP method to patch. URL will be Laravel. And let's just grab one. So forward slash tasks, forward slash, the one we're gonna update is 55. Then we have our authorization bearer token, headers, one more time. Then we have our body, but we're not gonna use form data right here. We're gonna use the form URL encoded. Now using the form URL encoded rather than the form data, we're making sure that the data that is being sent to the server uses the same encoding as the URL parameters. So if we add a key, let's say, of name and the value of, let's say, woohoo, just a test, click on send, you'll see that we have updated the name to woohoo and the description and priority are still the same. Now, just like showing data, we do need to perform some kind of validation because users shouldn't be allowed to update any task. If we change the right parameter to one, click on send, you'll see that we just updated ID number one, where the title has set pin to woohoo. The validation that we're going to perform is pretty much the same, like the if statement we did in the show method. So let's place it right at the top. 
In a second, when we finish the destroy method, we're gonna clean up our code because we're pretty much performing the same steps every single time. But for now, let's leave it as it is. If we save it and navigate back to Postman and submit it one more time, you'll see that we're not authorized. If we change the ID to 55, you'll see that we, well, we named it the same name, but the ID is 55 and the task is visible. The last request that we need to perform is deleting one single resource. Instead of doing a request to get a single eloquent resource, we could directly pass in the task object right here again. And the destroy method is pretty easy because we can grab our task and chain the delete method to it. We're not gonna send back a task resource since we have deleted that resource, so we can't really show it anymore to a user. But what we can do is returning a response and instead of chaining the JSON method to it, we're simply gonna add a null for the message or content and a status code of 204, which means no content. So there's no point of sending back anything once a resource has been deleted. Now let's navigate back to Postman and let's create our last request. Is delete task. And let me actually save all my requests because they all have a title of, let's see, all right because they all had a get icon and they're updated now. Now let's delete a task. Let's change it to delete. The request is pretty much the same. So API task and one specific ID. Now let's start off actually by deleting ID number one. The authorization is the bearer token. The header is an accept followed with a content type. The value is application JSON and there's no need to add a body right here. Click on send. And as you can see, the status code is 204. If we try to submit it one more time, you'll see that there are no results found and we can't really delete it anymore. Now, the issue that we have right now is the fact that we can still delete any task because we just deleted a task with ID number one. And we actually have to perform the same check we did twice already. And this can be fixed without duplication. So let's do that. Let's define a new method called private function is not authorized. Now it accepts a task because it needs to check for a task. And what we're gonna do right here is pretty much copy the if statement of let's say the update method and paste it inside of it. Go to the top and start off by removing our if statement at the show method. And what we're actually gonna do right here is pretty cool because we're gonna make use of a ternary operator. So we're gonna directly return, and I'll remove the bottom one in a second, a check whether this is not authorized is true or not. And we're gonna pass in the task that we have right here as a route parameter. If it is, print out the check. Else, return our new task resource. So let's remove the keyword return, and this is it. Let's test it out. Let's navigate back to Postman and open the find one task. If we click on send, you'll see that ID number 55 is still visible. And if we change it to, let's say three, you'll see that we're getting an error message from our is not authorized method saying we are not authorized to make this request. Navigate back. We have the update method, which is difficult because we're performing multiple things right here. So let's keep it as it is but we can do the same thing for our destroy method. So let's do it one more time. Let's go right under our return statement and define a new one where we're gonna check if it's not authorized. What needs to be checked is the task. If it is, print it out. Else, just delete the task directly. Now let's remove everything that we have above. Save it, navigate back to Postman. Let's say that we want to delete task number two, which we're not allowed to. So this part of the turn rear operator is being triggered right now. If we check 55, which we should be able to delete, you'll see that it has been returned a one, which is true. We're coming to the end of our Laravel Sanctum tutorial, but one functionality I let out on purpose was the logout functionality since we do need to be located on a protected route before it can be shown. Now, if we navigate back to Visual Studio Code and open our auth controller for a second, 
We did define the logout method at the bottom, right here. But we haven't really done anything inside of it. Let's do it. Let's remove our return statement. And Laravel Sanctum allows you to revoke tokens by deleting them from the database through the has API tokens trait. So if we call the odd facade and get one specific user that is logged in, it allows us now to add the current access token method to it. Finally, we're gonna delete it from the database, so let's chain the delete method to it. IntelliSense isn't recognizing the current access token method, and let's check whether we're getting an error message once we log out or not. Now what we're gonna do right here is return this success from our HTTP response trait, and we're gonna pass in an array where we're simply gonna add a message saying you have successfully been logged out and your token has been deleted. Before we continue on, let's quickly hop to table plus, open the personal access tokens table, and right here you'll see, well, four tokens, and let's delete them. Let's refresh our table. All right, it is empty right now. And let's walk through the process one more time. Let's navigate back to Postman. Let's go to the forward slash login endpoint. Let's send it. Now we need to make sure that we replace our new token with our previous token. So let's click on our Laravel Sanctum tutorial workspace. At the right side, you'll see environments where we have our globals. So let's open it. And right here, you'll see our Sanctum token, the initial value, and let's replace the current value as well. Don't forget to save it right here, which is important. Otherwise, you're not authorized. So let's close it. Now let's go back to our collections and actually perform a get all tasks. Right here, you'll see that we have all tasks. If we navigate to table plus and refresh our personal access tokens, you'll see that we have a new one. Now let's click on log out, where we have our params of nothing. Authorization needs to be the bearer token because it needs to know which one needs to be deleted. And let's add headers of accept and content type with the value of application. We don't need a body and it is a post request. So let's click on send. And as you can see, the status code of 200 has been printed out with a message saying that you have successfully been logged out and your token has been deleted. If we navigate back to table plus, refresh our table, you'll see that our token is completely deleted from our database. There's one more functionality that I want to highlight and that's token expirations. By default, Sanctum tokens will never expire and it's up to you, so the developer, to implement the functionality, which needs to be done inside the configuration file inside the convict folder. So right here, where you'll find a sanctum.php file. Now we are not gonna touch the stateful, but if we scroll down, you'll see a key value pair called expiration. By default, the value is equal to null, meaning that it will never expire. So whatever data you add right here needs to be an integer because it will represent the number of minutes until a token will expire. If we replace it to, let's say, 43800, our token will expire every 30 days. This doesn't work out of the blue. Sanctum recommends implementing a scheduler which will delete expired tokens after a certain amount of time. And don't worry, the scheduler doesn't need to be created by ourselves, since Laravel Sanctum provides one for us. Now schedulers needs to be added inside the console folder, inside the app folder, where there's a kernel.php file. Right here, you'll see a protected function called scheduler, and let's remove the comment that has been added by default. We've got the scheduler object right here, so let's call it first, and we're gonna chain the command method to it. Inside the command method, we need to include sanctum is artisan command, which is the sanctum colon prune dash expired. We could add additional flags right here, which checks how long a token needs to be expired for. So we can basically say space double dash hours is equal to 24, meaning that it will only delete tokens that have been expired for longer than 24 hours. Finally, we need to chain another method to our command method, which will tell our scheduler when our scheduler needs to be performed. So let's say daily. Now, if we navigate back to the CLI, 
perform the php artisan schedule list command you'll see that we have one new scheduler defined which is the scheduler that we just created so the sanctum prune expired scheduler if you like to test the scheduler cron on your local machine you simply need to run php artisan schedule colon work and we hit enter you'll see that it's running the schedule every single minute i won't be waiting for this so i'll wrap up the video right now so this was it for our Laravel Sanctum tutorial, where we defined traits, set up postmen, defined routes, worked on the authentication and task functionalities, we restricted routes, and we worked on revoking our tokens and token expirations. If you do like my content and you want to see more, don't forget to hit that like button, and if you're new to this channel, don't forget to subscribe as well.